Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm Jennifer Holmans. I'm the founder and director of the Center for Ballet and the Arts, which is co-sponsoring this event. And uh, I'm here to welcome you to Songs of Bukovina, a conversation with Alexei Ratmansky and many of his colleagues here who I'll be introducing to you. We are thrilled to be presenting this event, the Center for Ballet and the Arts, with American Ballet Theater, with the Remark Institute at NYU, and with Lincoln Center. So this is really a big group affair. Um, I'd also like to remind you that Songs of Bukovina will be performed as part of an all Ratmansky program from May 21st to May 23rd at the Metropolitan Opera House, so please don't miss it. Finally, I'd like to make a special thank you to American Express for making the, this event possible uh, through the Center for Ballet and the Arts. So, my job here tonight is to moderate and to introduce to you these people and to help this conversation take place. Um, just a, a, a momentary word about the center, since we are uh, presenting this event um, with ABT and Lincoln Center. The center is a research center for the performing arts. It's organized around dance. We have a, a robust fellowship program where we bring artists and scholars into uh, an environment to work together and to do their own work. And we also do public programming, often along with cultural institutions in New York, like this one here. So that's my little thing about the center. Um, this evening, we're here to take a close look at Alexei Redmansky's beautiful ballet, Songs of Bukovina. We're going to do that, thank you on your behalf, but um, we're going to do that by um, bringing together this group of people. We have tonight, and I, I encourage you to look at your programs because I'm not gonna go through their full bios, it's just I don't wanna take the evening on it. But we're going to have uh, Mike Beckerman here, is a music scholar from NYU who's going to talk to us about, about the music of Songs of Bukovina. Larry Wolf is a historian of, of Eastern Europe, also from NYU, who is going to be speaking with us about the place. Bukovina. Christine Chevchenko is a dancer who you have perhaps seen in this ballet and, and many others with ballet theater. She's a principal dancer. And of course, you know Alexei. Um, we're going to start this evening, just to give you the plan of the, of the night, we're going to start with a brief, some brief excerpts that Alexei Retmansky selected for us from the ballet just to remind you, or if you haven't seen it, give you a, a taste of, of, of what we're talking about. Then uh, Alexei is going to speak for a few minutes about the, the ballet, and then we're going to turn to each of the panelists that we have here to uh, tell us something about their particular area of expertise. After that, we'll all talk and then open it up to you. So, if we can just begin with the, the clips from the ballet, and then I will finally let you have the star of the show. <laughs> so, maybe we can just begin. If well, you... these were sections from different parts of the ballet. It was actually difficult to, to choose because it's, uh, uh, it's one flow. It's, uh, even though it's a suite of dances, but... Um, um, there are no different parts that could be ex, you know, taken from the ballet. Anyway, I think it's all started with uh, my, live, uh, my love to, um, for the music of uh, Lenny Desetnikov, who is a Russian composer living in uh, St. Petersburg. He was born in uh, Ukraine and raised there. Uh, I was born in, in Russia, but raised in Kiev, Ukraine. Um, and I feel that we have a lot of in common, a lot of history, a lot of ideals, a lot of tastes and stuff. Um, my first collaboration with Leonid was in 2006, when I, uh, after invitation of Peter Martins, uh, choreographed a ballet uh, called Russian Seasons for uh, New York City Ballet. Since then, um, we worked quite a few times, and Bukovina is uh, six, our sixth collaboration. 
So I think it was like uh, just a birthday greetings call, and I called him, and he mentioned he's writing the uh, piano preludes. And I was looking for the for the music for the new piece for APT, and I said, "Can I can I use it?" He said, "Yeah, but uh, uh, you know, I dedicated it to uh, uh, Alexei Garibol, the pianist, who is his partner and a brilliant pianist. So I, it's really like important that he plays uh, the the premiere." And I uh, I checked with ABT, and luckily they agreed. So they brought Alexei to New York to play um, uh, to play the opening. Uh, the next big challenge was um, for me to to choose the preludes because the 24 preludes I felt it's a bit much in the context of the triple bill. Because um, of course the composer works like uh, a drama director. He, you know, there is a narrative threat, maybe not narrative but dramatic threat. Um, yeah, the high points, the contrast and balance between the slow and fast, between melancholy and jo joyful, between uh, melodic and dissonant. Um, Alexei, before you go a little bit further, can I just stop you and just yes. ask you how, you said there were certain things that you had, you felt you had in common. Can you say a little about, about I think what it's those a things were? It's a history. Be? You know, we, we were born in, in Soviet Russia even though U Ukraine is a Ukraine, but it was very much part of Russia. Everybody spoke Russian, like the TV programs, the radio programs, uh, the, the, you know, the style of performing, the music, official sort of rules or standards were, were the same uh, in all territories of, of uh, Soviet Union. So, um, and the, and, the, and the upbringing, the um, you know the schools, very tough professional schools like we had in ballet schools, in Kiev uh, or or Moscow or Leningrad, and he had in, in musical school in Kharkov. It was very demanding, very tough, um, you know, uh, style um, of education. So. Um, so when you did this, did you actually work together as he was making the music? We did. The score no. Existed already? No. 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 Yeah. I. I have a complete trust in him. Um, uh, so I knew that you know he's he's writing uh, 24 preludes, which is a, um, a certain musical uh, standard following um, Chopin or Shostakovich. You know, uh, he goes through all the keys and uh, he's just gonna do what he needs to do as a composer, and I would gladly follow. So when you structured the ballet, are you structuring it? Because if you, I mean, we saw a little bit, there are, there are certain characters, right? There's the girl in red, who we're going to hear from, who's now in green. <laughs> um, and, um, and then there's, I mean, maybe you could introduce us a little bit to how you actually thought about putting, was there a dramatic structure for you? Was it a musical structure? Was it a... So, um, it was a, it was a, long process and not necessarily straightforward because the first thing I knew is that my, my new ballet is part of the triple bill. Then uh, I had a list of dancers who are very busy with something else. Then I had the list of dancers that I knew I wanted to use, so I had to balance those two lists. Um, I couldn't use those who are too busy, who are doing two other pieces in the program, you see. Then um, it's always amazing that these are the thing. That, you know, these are the things that decide. Well, it's, it's just a reality, <laughs> and y things. yeah, you work around it. And then uh, I was waiting for him to. I was waiting for him to complete the music. He sent me parts of it, and I I listened to it, and I realized that I, I'm falling in love with, with the music. So I was anxious to to hear the whole thing. Then it was a process of cutting, and then. Um, then I decided that I use uh, Christina and I use Isabella, these two ladies as the principals. And for the men, I had Calvin, uh, who you saw uh, doing the solo, Calvin Royal, and uh, Alban Lendorf, a uh, guest um, star from Denmark. So Calvin, I would uh, pair with Christina, and I ha already had them dancing my ballet together when they were still in the corp. Uh, there was uh, Shostakovich. 
piano, piano concerto. Piano concerto, yeah. Yeah, and I thought they were just, you know, uh, there was uh, a real chemistry between them two. So I wanted to give them another chance to dance together. And I thought Bella and Alban is a wonderful couple. Well, all the plans, f you know, fell apart when Alban uh, felt the terrible knee in his uh, pain in his knee, and he couldn't continue. So um, we we had to reshuffle the whole thing and have Gabe um, uh, share, Gabe share, Gabe share mm -hmm. yeah. dancing with Isabella, and uh, then Christina and Calvin moved to the first cast. Um, and uh, originally, I think I had two demi solo couples and another four couples, but then I ended up with just four couples behind them who are uh, solos because each of them have a chance to do a little solo. So that structure was clear for me. And then uh, having, you know, the casts and having the music chosen, I would think uh, carefully which music belongs to whom. And uh, I uh, wanted to make sure that Christine and Bella uh, and the solo man, they have enough material, they have a party there, then uh, the transitions between the groups and solos, all that had to be taken into consideration. And the last step was uh, actually creating the steps. And that happens um, on the day of the rehearsal in the morning with the earphones, um, you're, yes, you're known yeah. for your earphones, I think. Is that right? Right. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, bringing the steps or idea of the steps into the studio and seeing um, how the dancers take it. And then as soon as you establish a certain starting material, uh, it, you know, it develops almost by itself because... Um, yeah, the personalities of the dancers, the number of hours you have per day, all these take um, play play a role into the process. Okay, very good. That does give us some. So I think before we go on, maybe we'll just move to Larry. Would you like to give a few words about the about? Larry's going to talk to us about the place Bukovina, and then we you know we'll be able to be a little freer in our conversation. Thank you very much, and I should say um, that um, as the director of the Remark Institute, how pleased I am that we were able to co-sponsor this with the Center for Ballet of the Arts and with Lincoln Center. Um, my job as the European historian is to um, emphasize that Bukovina was a real place, that it's not a mythological space, it's not a ballet kingdom. It was um, a real place with borders of its own. It existed as a province of the Habsburg monarchy across the 19th century. It even has a, a coat of arms, which is the um, now extinct um, European wild ox, um, and a very important um, capital city um, at um, Chernovitz right here, now Chernivtsi in Ukraine. Um, if you look into the middle of the 20th century, Bukovina ceases to exist, and the territory that used to be Bukovina is divided between Romania and Ukraine, and the identity of Bukovina is effaced over the course of the second half of the 20th century, so that it becomes a kind of mythological space and space of fantasy for creative play and you know brilliant um, creative works like the one that Alexei has created here. Um, it's a province of the Habsburg monarchy and was annexed to the Habsburg monarchy as its easternmost territory in the late 18th century by the Empress Maria Theresa. Um, the Habsburg monarchy was ruled from Vienna. Um, and you can see how remote Bukovina was from Vienna, um, but it received all of its identity from Vienna over the course of its existence in the 19th century. Before it became part of the Habsburg monarchy, it was actually an outpost of Moldavia, Moldavia, which was also part um, under the overlordship of the Ottoman Empire. So Bukovina is really a frontier space. It was a frontier space between the Ottoman Empire and the Habsburg monarchy, which changes hands in the 18th century. Very complicated history. Um, but you can see that within the Habsburg monarchy, it's a crown land of its own with its capital at Chernovitz, um, adjoining Galicia here and Hungary over here, and with the Russian Empire on to the east. So it's a frontier space throughout its existence. 
Um, that was, by the way, the Kaiser Franz Josef, we were looking at there, who ruled over um, Bukovina during the whole second half of the 19th century and into the early 20th century, and gave it a large part of its identity, as you'll see. Um, in, after World War I, Bukovina is absorbed into Romania and becomes a province in Romania. And after World War II, it's absorbed into Ukraine and becomes a tiny little province in western Ukraine. And its Ukrainian peace, its Ukrainian legacy and culture is part of what informs the ballet, Songs of Bukovina. And maybe we'll talk more about that later. But um, its identity is effaced over the course of the later 20th century. It just becomes a corner of western in Ukraine. Um, if we were thinking about Bukovina topographically, the crucial thing is that it's mountainous. And you can see in this 18th century topographical map, you can see the mountains that are drawn across Bukovina. Um, that's interesting from the point of view of the ballet, because the mountains, they're the Carpathian Mountains in Eastern Europe. They're very beautiful if you've ever been there. Um, what's interesting about the mountains is that they preserve folkloric culture. Mountains are great conservators of culture. They're isolated, they're retreating in retreat, and the kinds of folkloric materials that um, serve as part of the basis for the ballet would emerge from the preservation in the mountainous landscape of Bukovina. Um, if you were um, thinking about the culture of Bukovina, it's very much an Orthodox religious culture, that is to say, Greek Byzantine Orthodoxy on both its um, Romanian portion and its Ukrainian portion. Um, the, if you were going to Bukovina, the thing you would really want to see, one of the great beauties of Europe that you might not know about if you've never been there, are the painted churches of, of the Bukovina. And they're mostly done in the 15th and 16th century. They're Orthodox churches, and their unique feature, you can see, is that they're not painted on the inside. They're painted, although they are painted on the inside, they're also painted on the outside externally, which creates conservation problems that you can scarcely imagine, um, artistic masterpieces that are painted externally. But they're part of the um, Orthodox culture of the Bukovina, and you can see See, it's a very complicated one. There's a last judgment. I don't know if you can see, it's actually also external. It's under the roof of the church. Um, so a very sophisticated religious culture and a complicated ethnographic culture because the green tells you where the Romanians are, the red tells you where the Ukrainians are. It's not until the later 19th century that those Orthodox peoples in the mountains are clearly differentiated from one another. And the most interesting locus here in the capital city of Chernivtsi or Chernovitz, you can see a, almost a perfect pie chart, chart in which it's divided among Ukrainians, Romanians, Jews, Germans, and Poles. And Bukovina was a model of the Habsburg monarchy in miniature and a kind of fantasy for um, multi-ethnic coexistence for a certain part of its career as a Habsburg crown land, a fantasy that was busted in the 20th century in lots of ways that you're familiar with. Um, here's the Cher Chernovitz in its German name, Chernots in Romanian, Chernivtsi today in Ukraine. Um, if you were looking at the city, um, Franz Josef, the Habsburg emperor for the 19th century, was very prominent everywhere in the city. There's his statue in the Stadtpark. And here's the university that was founded in the 19th century by Franz Josef and named for him as the Franz Josef Universität in, Cher in Chernovitz. Um, and um, it's very close to Vienna. One of the things to keep in mind about Western Ukraine is it has no historic ties with Moscow before the middle of the 20th. 20th century, all of its ties are connected to Vienna, and there's a certain degree of nostalgia for Vienna even to this day in Western Ukraine. Um, what you're looking at there, and this is a slip on my slide, um, you're looking at a Habsburg Archduke, Otto, working the streets of Chernovitz, not in 1907, which was my mistake on the image, and that's when the Habsburgs should have been in Chernovitz, but this was 2007, the great grand nephew of Franz Josef, always at home in Chernovitz, which is a Habsburg city at the age of 95 in 2007. I was there later that year in 2007, and everybody talked about how thrilled they were to have a Habsburg Archduke return to Chernovitz. They, he, they felt it was his city, he felt it was his city. 
Um, it's a city that's built in the style of Habsburg neoclassicism in the 19th century. Um, here you can see it, a postcard greetings out of um, Chernovitz, and there's the, um, the, ta the town hall. Um, that's the German gymnasium where my grandfather went to high school at the, in the very early 20th century, also built in Habsburg neoclassical style. Um, this is the, um, the um, residence of the Orthodox Archbishop, which is today the university, um, and built in a historicist style by a Czech architect from elsewhere in the Habsburg monarchy, in a style that's both um, Orthodox and almost Moorish in its Oriental inspiration in the way that it's constructed. It's a brilliant work of historicist architecture, but the style of architecture that defines late 19th, early 20th century Chernobyl is Art Nouveau or Secession. There you see it in the Hotel Bristol, right? It has the most modern architecture. It has this brilliant Art Nouveau theater in the central square um, where a ballet is still performed. I actually checked the program. They're performing Swan Lake on Friday night of this week. Um, but what I want to emphasize here is the tension between the high, high culture of Art Nouveau Chernovitz and the folk culture of the mountain because it's one of the things that interests me most in the ballet, Alexi, is the transmutation of the folkloric materials into the high art of classical ballet. And those tensions, those poles, are very present in Bukhovina in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, what you're looking at here is the theater again, and right next to it is the Yiddish National House, the Jewish National House, also an Art Nouveau monument, as you can see. Um, these are the people who held the first international Yiddish Congress in that house in 1908. It was meant to, Chernovitz was meant to be the home for a national, an international Yiddish culture as well. Um, Bukovina is so interesting to its Jewish residents that we actually have maps printed in the Hebrew language that show us Galician, the Bukovina, right, printed in Hebrew characters um, to affirm that identity. And what you're looking at there is the great synagogue of Chernovitz, um, again built in Moorish style, destroyed during World War II, and the remains transformed into a movie theater today, where you can go to the cinema. The great poet of, I'm sorry that we're missing the, the rest of this image, the great poet of Chernovitz was Paul Salon, who in the middle of the 20th century wrote the great poem about the Holocaust, the Shoah, Death Fugue. Um, Death is a master from Germany, der Tod ist ein Meister aus Deutschland. Um, but what I want to emphasize in conclusion is that going back to the late 19th century, um, the most early, the, the earliest folklore explorations by the earliest professional folklorists were focused on the mountains of Bukovina and creating postcards and images of the folk costumes of the mountains of Bukovina. And that um, the um, embroideries of the mountains of Bukovina were part of that folk culture, were being collected then as they are still. And both um, embroideries, costumes, and music all form part of a folkloric whole. So the last thing I would say is that, um, coming back to the point I made before, is that one of the interesting tensions is between, on the one hand, the preservation of folkloric culture in the mountains and the very high culture of the university, the theater as they came to exist. There's a Schiller monument in the center of Chernovitz as a sort of monument to high German culture, which it also represented. And the tension between those elements is one of the things that I think about when I think about this brilliant ballet. So oh, thank you, Larry. That's terrific. And maybe we can we'll talk further when we've heard from the other people about both the history and Alexa's re reaction to it, and uh, uh, where the ballet fits in that the, history. You want to say yeah, something the, now? The, the pictures of the fall costumes. The, these were the pictures that they've sent to uh, costume designer Morris Junge, and uh, we actually ended up with very minimal 
almost nothing resembles except the v v vivid colors. You mean those those th those kind of images? Right, right, right. Because if you Google Bukovina, you'll come across these extraordinary headpieces that are huge, made of flowers. They have they're phenomenal. We were considering having a, a figure or maybe two dancers wear the full full costumes, you know, at some point at the very beginning or at the very end or something, but ended up actually not not doing it. Um, um, I. Um, I think that, that that would have been an interesting way to go, but I think that it's implicit in the materials that you're working with, the ways in which um, folk motifs play, even without the costumes, the ways in which folk motifs are being um, used in classical ba ballet. It's not the first time, of, of course, but it seems to me very striking here, um, especially considering the musical sources. I think the music actually gave a, a, a certain path for us, it it like it does use uh, uh, folkloric motifs, and I think each of the preludes is based on a folk melody. But at the same time, uh, y you can't ignore the, the the whole development of the music in the 20th century and learning its own understanding. So it's 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 uh, it's based on the folk, but it's very far from it. That's a perfect <laughs> segue. Mike is going to talk to us about the music. Oh, thanks. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it was a, it was a real treat to to work on this, uh, the beautiful ballet and, and and quite fascinating music. As you've just heard, uh, <clears throat> each of the preludes is based on a, a folk song that was taken from a book uh, called Songs of Bukovina, a collection. And I, I thought that I would uh, I was lucky that the the composer sent me a, a link to to the book that he had used along with some comments, and I thought I would just sort of begin right, right in with, with the original song and then the kinds of things that, that he does. So here's, here's the original. Um, the wind blows over the steps. It's, it, oh, these are just single line tunes. So when we're thinking about the transmission, uh, we have the transcription, we have the musical artwork and the ballet, uh, we have to imagine the original uh, from which the transcription was made. Uh, it's a, it, here's the... Kind of mountain tune in a way, even though the step is in the title, you can you can hear sort of the the kind of music that's meant to echo in the hills, uh, and this is the opening, and and I think it's um, a fascinating way to open the set, which the composer chose as the first song and is also the first piece in the ballet, because it begins um, with a dissonance, a, a, a ninth. And then the tune comes in. So we have a couple of things which are really uh, hallmarks of a lot of different folk arrangements over, over time. Uh, we have all kinds of fascinating rhythmic displacement. Uh, we have um, an original accompaniment and, of course, an added dissonance. This, because the original... So that little thorn, I, I don't want to be too facile in saying this, but it seems that part of the drama of this piece, at least in a musical sense, which I think is picked up beautifully, is somehow working out the relationship between that dissonance and, and these wonderful moments of, of consonance. Now, folk songs um, were tricky because people transcribed them and then they wanted to arrange them. But uh, often, if you had a piece like this, so this is a Scottish folk song.
Now, we, we might do it like this. Oh, Beethoven couldn't do that. that. That going from that to that, never. So he puts it. So he, he goes. Instead of. So it, it was a sort of a really imposing a, an old-fashioned idea of harmony in a way on these pieces. And even in, in Russian music, the early folk song collections like... And then Mussorgsky came along and... Those kinds of chords, these modal chords, which try to, in a way, reflect the, the inner life of these pieces uh, in, in a way. And, and many Russian composers. These kinds of modal, really defying it. So when, when Balakirov published a collection of Russian folk songs and arranged them with sounds like this, A German professor reviewed it and said, ganz falsch. It's all wrong because th there were these innovative harmonies. And I think uh, this composer has, has in many ways uh, tried to update that in, in ways that are quite exciting. So, for example, here's the, the second uh, tune. That's from the folk song collection. And Ratmansky's, I mean, uh, uh, the Stiatnikov's arrangement it begins with this kind of, we have, he puts it in the minor key instead of, but a dissonance. So we have these kinds of almost uh, Schoenbergian, these rather really fascinating harmonies underneath uh, th that, that take, take these pieces in a slightly different direction. Some of these things are absolutely exquisite uh, and, and dissonance really drops out. So here's the original tune. This is the third piece in, in the set. setting. You know, so, you know, beautiful, this. Absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous harmonizing uh, of, the, of this melody. Uh, and, and throughout, uh, one of the pieces you've seen um, has this extremely complex rhythm. Uh, so, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five. So again, uh, there's a, all these wonderful comp complex rhythms, and you saw that in the clip. Um, and I, I was astonished by how fluidly the dancers moved so that one was hardly even aware of, of this kind of, of uh, complexity here. Um, just a couple of more of these tunes. So here's another one. A trans this is one of the transcriptions from the folk song. And here we get this kind of... So those kinds of dissonances are added. And this is something that composers like Stravinsky and Janacek and Bartok would do. Janacek would take a tune like. Or 
Fort Tucker. So we, we have that kind of Bartokian, Janachkian density uh, that, that is part of these. Um, and again, here's one more. So that's the original, and, and it, 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 in this version, it starts with this flourish. You saw bits of that. So again, these sort of rather simple folk tunes are transformed in, in ways that are extraordinary. And again, it just there's a kind of Bartokian style to it in this additive rhythms. So, you know, Bartok wrote pieces like... So one to one to one to three, one to one to one to three, from which people like Dave Brubeck did, right? And this has this has a a, a, a final part here that you'll hear is um, a, it's it's kind of in eight eighth notes, but it's. So again, we, we have from the beginning to the end of this, we, we have sort of rhythmic depth, uh, a combination of exquisite, sweet harmonies, and at the same time, a range of these pungent dissonances. And, and if in writing 24 preludes, uh, he carried on the tradition of prelude, I think he was also being relatively encyclopedic about the tradition of folk song setting as well, a kind of compendium of different ways to use an original piece of folk music. And, and it goes without saying that the kinds of things that you saw in those maps and, and heard Larry speak about Bukovina, the enormous variety the, the, is also something you get in this music. Um, almost every piece, in a way, suggests a kind of different world. And one can imagine, I didn't check it all out, that each of these probably appears in another folk song collection. One would be called Romanian, one would be called Hungarian, one Polish, one Ukrainian. Uh, but together they're collected in this marvelous fusion uh, of the music of Bukovina, but thought through by a composer who understands the history of music and particularly the history of setting folk songs. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Um, okay, maybe we can turn to Christina now and just maybe you could just talk to us a little bit about what it's like to dance some of these things. I think Mike even played the music from one of your solos and uh, this right. discussion of the music. I mean, we can open this up. Perfect. Um, I'm just going to start with a brief description of uh, where I came from and where my family came from in Ukraine. Um, I had to write it down because my Ukrainian is not, not so good anymore, so it's hard for me to remember these cities. But um, my mother and father are both Ukrainian. Um, I was born in Odessa, uh, which is southern Ukraine. It's a port city. Uh, my grandma is from the village of Yaroslavka in the area of Spolyansky, uh, in the region of Cherkasky. And uh, my mom always spent her summers there as a small girl, and she told me it was as beautiful as described in literature by the famous Taras Shevchenko. Um, my aunts lived in Viv and Kiev, and my uncle in Boyarka, which belongs to the region of Kiev. Um, neither my family or I have ever been to Bukovina, but... Um, I've heard that it's one of the prettiest places in Western Ukraine on the Carpathian Mountains. Um, I recently watched a Ukrainian movie called Stolen Happiness. Um, it's based on the writing of a famous Ukrainian author, Ivan Franco. Um, the movie, in the movie, the setting and the scenery takes place in Bukovina and it showcases its glorious beauty really well. Um, so it really is a truly beautiful place. Um, I am very glad that Alexei Ratmansky created this piece, and I'm blessed to have been a part of it, so thank you. Um, this piece brings me back to my roots, to where I came from, to where I was born. Um, it's a warm and comforting feeling, and I am so happy to have been a part of that. 
Um, I think Bukovina is definitely folk inspired. Um, you can see that by the women's costumes, which have aprons and colorful ribbons and the braided hair, which is placed on the head in a crown-like fashion, uh, reminiscing the famous Ukrainian wreath, which is usually worn on special occasions. Um, this sort of hints on the idea that there's a celebration of some sort happening in the piece, possibly. Um, Alexei chose 12 of uh, 24 preludes um, written by Dusatnikov, and um, each one is very different in texture and tone. Um, Alexei definitely showcases um, this essence um, really well. Uh, so some are cheerful, some are upbeat, some suggest um, a hint of sadness and grief. Um, so they're very, very different. I, um, my favorite part of this ballet actually is the first couple of steps that I take on stage. Um, it's my entrance. It's my absolute favorite part. Um, so this entrance sort of feels like a significant walk down a red carpet um, led by my partner. And um, it's a truly incredible moment. And every time I've walked on stage in this moment, I've gotten chills um, because it's, it's quite incredible. Um, to me, this walk, um, I guess, is sort of like a wedding, a bride and groom going to a wedding. Um, on stage, there is an ensemble of four men and four women. Um, to me, they are the villagers in Bukovina um, attending the wedding and frolicking around. So it's quite a, it's quite a beautiful scene. Um, the rehearsal process has been wonderful, and I absolutely love working with Alexei Ramansky um, whenever I get a chance to. Um, one of my favorite parts in this ballet is this beautiful solo that he created um, for the lead ballerina. And the music is just, the melody is so luscious, it just makes you want to cry happy tears. It's really, really touching. Um, another part that was, I guess, one of the most difficult parts was um, this duet with only my partner and I. And um, in about like two minutes time, we have to move in complete unison. Um, to high-paced high music, um, executing intricate steps. And um, this was definitely quite a challenge because it takes time to feel your partner and to know how he anticipates his steps so you can move exactly the same. Um, Alexei was very precise with how he wanted our heads, arms, and bodies to move and turn the exact same way. Um, so it was, it was a really, uh, it was really fun and challenging to work on that, but it definitely reflects um, the beauty of Tsatnikov's music and definitely the celebration of the folkloric traditions of this region. So, I mean, it was an absolute incredible process and I was thrilled to be a part of it. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. So let's just open it up so we can talk a little bit. I mean, maybe I'll just start by saying, you know, I'm struck by s s the, the ways in which we're talking about this as a kind of folkloric. I mean, did, did you think of it that way? And if so, how do you place that in time? And how do you place that in the present day moment? Why did you choose Bokovina now? <clears throat> well, first of all, Christina, it's such a pleasure to have you in the studio. You an amazing oh, thank dancer, you. <clears throat> thank and you. thank you, thank you for your kind words. Uh, I remember the first time we were working on a solo, and um, you and Bella. Yes, yes. And there is this the quite simple step was a PK was a double with bed. open arms. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. And uh, you can see immediately that she has in her blood like opening opening the arms endlessly, <laughs> yeah. and that, the, that port de bras, mm -hmm. yeah, the movement of the arm that comes from, uh, from the soul. I, I, I don't like this description, but it, it comes from something that is hidden in your um, chest. In your chest, yeah, <laughs> inside. You, you can't describe it differently. Yes, and, yes. Uh, uh, th this movement is like one of the, one of the important moments of, uh, of the ballet, and Christina did it beautifully. Each song has lyrics, and uh, I researched that. Um, uh, interesting that Desiatnikov uh, did put the titles to each prelude, 
at the beginning of his work, and then he eliminated it. He didn't want it to be written down. But the, 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 those, those words exist, and it's mostly about um, the war and death, or um, the unhappy love, as in folk songs, you know, this, this um, um, uh, dark side of life you can only deal with uh, singing because that, that sort of peace you, give you, give you peace of the, the troubles. Um, <clears throat> so, no narrative, and we, we did, I, I, I think I gave some, some images that yeah, might some might help. Hints, right. like we, it's it's not really a wedding, and it's not. Yeah, I know. It's it's not really a celebration, but uh, it's important um, to to sparkle the imagination of the dancers with certain images, and then they go from there and develop it uh, by themselves, listening to the music and um, ab absorbing and learning the steps and the coordination, developing it. <clears throat> so, for example, the solo of Calvin that you saw. Um, we would, I would call it a, a soldier on a run, the soldier who is, uh, who is uh, afraid, um, and so on. And what was it? What did you say for the for this entrance that that Christina was? It just, uh, I think, it was a, a, a gathering. Uh, some sort of gathering. In a the, sort right? of gathering, and after all the laughs and talks and drinks. Uh, there is a song, and she sings it, and it should bring the tears. Oh. Yeah, it's very moving. Right, yeah. it should bring the but tears out she, of her isn't, isn't and she, out of the people around her. Isn't she different from the other people on the stage? She's in well, red. she's different because Christine is different, or ballet is different. Okay. It's, yeah. not, it's not part of the narrative of the ballet. Of course, the, 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 the solo dancer, the, the, the ballerina in the ballet, uh, she should reveal much more of herself than the others. So there is a certain error here, but it's not like it's a character. It's up to her to bring the colors to this role. And it's not even a role, it's a dancing part, I would say. And it becomes a role if the dancer of Christina's talent, you know, uh, feel free on stage because it's it's again it's a long process learning all these fives and and sixes you know learning all the head angles to be together that's you you, you can't uh, bring a role to life until you went through this process and yeah, sometimes absolutely. it's not there for the opening and it's it's a process that continues and um, uh, I haven't seen the performance of the second season, mm -hmm. uh, but I've heard from many people that it looks different than, uh, than it looked in the first. And I'm sure you've, you've felt more comfortable, more uh, Oh yeah, grounded. absolutely. Yeah. The, the more times I've performed this piece, the more comfortable I am right. dancing it. And I absolutely love dancing it now. It just feels like second nature. Because at the beginning it was quite a stress, I think, for everyone, it was, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, but it's it's wonderful yeah. now. I tend to, I mean, as a choreographer, I, I know it. Um, I tend to put too many steps in a short phrase, <laughs> so for, for the dancers need time to really find a way to, you know, feel comfortable with it, and that's why consciously I thought, well, the end, the the uh, entrance. Uh, of uh, Christina should be like super simple, just just steps on point, nothing else, to contrast the more complex continuation. I was going to ask how, how you went about choosing. Um, you know, it reminded me of, of you know when Schumann wrote Dichterliebe, uh, he had a whole bunch of poems to choose from, and he chose the first three, and then he started skipping around, and, and it seemed that that's that's what happened. Uh, so I, when, as I was looking through, oh, the first one, well, that's the first piece, second, third, but then it goes to nine, and, and then you came, obviously went back and forth a little bit. Could you talk a little bit about your thinking as you chose these pieces? Well, the first three felt like a perfect order yeah. in dynamics and, and contrasting moods. And then the moment I felt that I'm in doubt, I, I started to, to you know, look in other places. And as I said before, we had to create a, um, a very particular dynamics and contrasting moods and speeds within these 12 chosen preludes. 
then uh, I was literally very, very nervous when I was about to ask Leonid whether he approves my choice. And he simply says, well, the most important ones are there, so go with that. Could I ask you something else? You know, um, always, people have always wondered about the origins of music and speech and song or grunts and everything. And I, I sort of my outlier view is that uh, when human beings realized they really couldn't fly, they invented music. Um, but, but I guess in seeing this, I guess I would go further in saying when they found out that music couldn't quite do it for them, they invented ballet. Um, and, and there's something so buoyant and weightless about so much of this, even though there are weighty moments. Could you say anything about how you, how you think of things like buoyancy and weight and whether that is something you think about as you go through these pieces? I guess it's just choosing the vocabulary, choosing the steps and matching it in my head. Because when I was a dancer myself, I used to go to the studio and improvise for hours and film myself and, and see how it looks and stuff. But, uh, you know, uh, it transferred to my head. Now I have this little TV screen in my head. Listen to the music and just uh, uh, have the little dancers, little Christinas and, you know, uh, and Calvin's doing the steps and then I just spend time matching their movements with the music. Then I, because it takes so long to write things down, I try to memorize what I have uh, uh, came to, um, you know, and, and transfer it to the dancers in the studio and then it's their responsibility to, to remember things. And of course we have uh, brilliant Bell Masters assistants at ABC who would take care of the steps. So yeah, choosing, uh, matching the music to the, uh, to the steps, that's, that's the, the process, I think. But in a way that, that almost seems as if the dancers are improvising, uh, even though you know how carefully they've done it, but it seems as if they're inventing the steps almost on the spot. Well, if you get this impression, it's the best compliment because we spend a lot of time working on uh, that. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So it, it looks free, it looks spontaneous, it looks like the uh, music is born from the movements. It's not like the dancers follow the music or illustrate the music. No, I think the ideal dance is when you, you hear the music that is born from the, the movement, from the body of the dancer. Um, one of the things that I thought was interesting and beautiful about the ballet is um, the exceptional harmony, the exceptional grace, the striking elegance. Even where, as Mike says, even where the music is dissonant, it feels like the choreography, you know, very, very gracefully navigates the dissonance in the music. Um, so that it becomes a kind of fantasy space. And I wonder whether you feel there are I mean, because in folklore we'd look for this tensions and violence below the surface here, because, I mean, I'm pretty crude as a ballet observer, but I wasn't feeling that powerfully here, which made me think of it a little bit in relation to the kind of nostalgia that some historians would even feel for an older Bukovina. Bukovina is a place that no longer exists, but once existed in the times of our grandparents. Literally, the time of my grandfather it existed. He was there um, before the horrors of the 20th century. And whether some kind of nostalgia for that kind of space informs the harmony of the choreography, and then not to be too crude about this, but how would you see that and understand that in relation to the very traumatized space of national Ukraine over the course of the last five to 10 years? I think nostalgia is very much part of uh, Dysetnikov's style and, and language. Um, I think it's a very interesting question and I have a few thoughts, first of all, we're using point shoes. Point shoes means classical ballet. Classical ballet is a language of the past. Well, maybe it's too strong a statement, but it was invented by, you know, it started, you know, the best, uh, Louis XIV's courts and developed uh, under the courts. Uh, it was aristocratic art. 
Um, if you want grounded, more grounded movement, if you want to be of today, if you want to be contemporary, that's a contemporary ballet with much more plié, with uh, more contact with the floor. The point shoes is uh, directed up into the heaven and it, it creates a sort of ideal harmony of the lines. Um, giving it weight is a, is a, a, a challenging thing. And um, we're trying to counterbalance the stretch up into the heaven with a very deep plié, which I think, I don't know, Christina, you can comment on that. Uh, it might be very, very difficult on the, on the muscles, on the knees. Yeah, it's, it's just um, like for classical ballet to have such a grounded movement is much more harder on our bodies because we're not used to doing that. Um, well, it so you're not, you're not pulled straight. up, yeah, we're not you straight. You should be very free in your, in your spine. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah, it is difficult for, I think, for classical dancers to get that grounded, heavy quality. So consciously, we are looking to, to, to give the weight to the most classical of the steps. And basically, the vocabulary is class classical, but we, we want to color it with a certain coordination. The folk steps, there are very, very few suggestions, like when the girls do that. It's very Ukrainian and a uh, 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 couple of more steps, but very, very few, not, not constant. The um, the nostalgia for the ideal Bukovina or ideal state of uh, affairs, you know, for the for this country, uh, definitely is a, is not a literal commentary on the today's political situation. But uh, I mean, being a Russian speaking, uh, I guess, a Russian choreographer, having. Uh, um, uh, very strong bonds with Ukraine because I grew up there and my parents live there and my, my wife's family is from there, my family is there. And uh, having the Russian TV channel, uh, you know, at home and hearing the hatred and I don't know if it's the right word, the, the horrible propaganda that destroys Ukraine and calls Ukraine the, the enemy, you know, really Ukraine is the enemy of Russia now, officially. Uh, it's uh, mm, uh, super, super painful. So I guess it's a certain answer. It's not an answer, but it's, a, I guess, a, a, a reflection on, on, you know, on a tension of today. Yeah, um, you know, um, it's interesting because the original uh, collection project is a kind of Soviet imperial project of collecting these folk songs. So. I, I suppose you could say that Desnyatnikov wanted to, in some ways, decolonize these songs uh, and, and put them in another context, take them away from that attempt of, of the Soviets to sort of collect them all and, in effect, make them Russian, uh, and to somehow return them through that individuality, which I think has been continued in the ballet to a kind of a new framing of that. That makes sense, yeah. yeah. I agree with that. And can I just ask you, you know, in relation to both of these comments, the, the weightedness that you're talking about, and you mentioned earlier on that there was a dark side to some of these songs and in their texts that, that you are drawing on, and Mike was telling us about the dissonance and then this idea of nostalgia. Are you, are you going for some weightedness in this? Is there... How did you think about this dark side? Where, at the where, end, where is that? Or, at the or end, we were just, I was just following the music. I think the music says it all. And the beauty of ballet is that we, we don't really need to put it all in words. It's, uh, it's an imp we, we create impressions. We, we suggest, we, um, with the beauty of the dancers and their mastery, and if they had good ears and good hearts, uh, it's, it, you know, it comes across across the orchestra pit. Um, yeah, just listening carefully to the music. How did you choose the conclusion? Did you was that an obvious thing once you saw that piece? And how, how did you? Because that's a really remarkable conclusion. It, it, it has kind of two parts. The part I played, but then it's got something that almost sounds like a jazzy carnival. Uh, sort of, you know which some fragmented and so I, how did you come by that, that conclusion for the piece? 
Um, I think I mentioned it at the beginning. Uh, the, the process of choreographing is to a, 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 big, ex a big extent uh, is uh, intuitive. On the other hand, you, you create a certain, you, you choreograph certain material and then uh, it develops by its own rules, so to speak. So uh, sometimes you arrive somewhere you didn't know you, you want to go or uh, you plan things and they just don't feel organic and then you need to Can change. Can you give some examples of that from the... Um, I'm not sure, uh, well, I think I included, uh, I had to change music. I had to change a couple of preludes because it didn't feel right. I, um, so uh, on the way of choreographing, I was, I was changing a switch, yeah, switched. So um, what I was going to say is, honestly, it doesn't feel like a complete, you know, ballet. I, I f it feels like it needs tightening or it needs changing. Uh, un unlike Russian Seasons, the ballet that was my first collaboration with the Setnik, which uh, I don't want to change a step there, but this this is the one that I would like to work on to continue working. By adding material or just changing what you have, or, or uh, maybe both? By adjusting things, changing, yeah. Not pro uh, well, maybe in a, uh, if I'm lucky or, you know, to, to do the whole, the whole suite, whole 24, that would be interesting. In the original order, but I don't know, that's just dreams. I, I'm, I'm wondering also just, this whole question of the, the, the folk character of it, because you said, and it's certainly beautifully exhibited, that the vocabulary is fundamentally classical. So in a way, you're erasing that folk character. Is that a fair way of, of talking about it? I mean, because it, 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 it's, I think part of what we're all going around is it's Bukovina songs, but it's a ballet, right? Which is what is coming to you out of the music and out of the bodies of the dancers. But this relationship with the Ukrainian material or with the Bukovina material or with the whole past of that place is being, uh, muted in a way. It's, it's a combination of things. I don't think it's a portrait of Bukovina. I don't think it's a um, you know, presentation of uh, Bukovina and dances. I don't think it depicts U Ukrainian characters. But you, you can't go away from the experience of your childhood or like Christina would agree with that, yeah? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, the, 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 the language you speak at home, and so all, all of that Ukraine, uh, you know, uh, 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 Russian music, uh, um, then Googling, uh, you know, those in extraordinary scene images of those extraordinary monasteries with painting on the walls outside. And, um, and the landscapes, like this summer we went to see the place where my wife's mother, uh, she was born in Poland, and she was um, transported after the war. I mean, not she, her family, not her family, the whole village, the whole uh, region, actually the whole nation was uh, forcefully moved to Ukraine from Poland. And the, the Pol po Polish population of Ukraine was forced to move back to, uh, to um, so uh, it's a long story. Uh, but it's a, it's a part of the history of this region. So we went to see these mountains and these little villages and mountains. They're, they're extraordinary with, you know, with uh, bright streams and, uh, and uh, forests and uh, uh, yeah, animals and uh, mushrooms and uh, green greenery. This is just so beautiful. So I guess all of that is reflected, but it's 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 not folk ballet. I wouldn't call it the folk. Well, a relief, um, you know. I mean, considering how, especially under the Soviets, ethnography got way out of hand with these huge ensembles. We were talking about the movie The Cold War, uh, which is the first part of it is all about uh, the folk culture and the way people try to use it. So I, I, I thought it, it suggested in just the right tone, uh, Bukovina, without it ever trying to be ethnographic, which I think would have really just not worked at all. 
Uh, it, 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 maybe it would work, but it was just uh, different. The main is different, different thing. Yeah, the main inspiration is the music, and I think it really creates a certain path, and then you 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 try to track it. Um, what you, what you're describing in in terms of your your wife's family and the transportation of populations. That's a little bit true for Bukhovina as well. That is to say, Chernivtsi today, as a Ukrainian city, um, almost entirely a Ukrainian city, is lives its Ukrainian life against a backdrop of buildings that were created for a completely multicultural city in the 19th century. And the movement of populations, sometimes forced movement, sometimes voluntary movement, um, is part of what creates the Ukrainianness of Ukrainian Bukovina and the Romanianness of Romanian Bukovina on the other side of the border. But um, the nostalgia space for historians like us would be the space in which you could imagine a society that was more mixed, um, living harmoniously the way they do in the ballet, and it's one of the reasons that the harmony of the ballet is so moving, if you look at it from the point of view of a, you know, someone who thinks about the longer history of Bukovina. Um, the thick line that runs through Bukovina today is actually the Schengen border of Europe. That is to say, Romania on one side, Ukraine on the other side. Um, it's a tough border crossing. That is to say, you, it used to be really hard to cross from the Romanian side and get to Chernivtsi. You used to only be able to approach it from the Ukrainian side. Um, it's, it's easier to do that nowadays. I've gone as far as that border on the Romanian side and been stopped and turned back, right, 10 years ago. Um, but um, the idea the idea that these are um, ethnographically monolithic spaces, right, in Ukraine or in Rom Romania, that's something that's born of the middle of the 20th century, or maybe the early 20th century. Well, the Jewish culture was a very big part of it. Very important. And uh, you, you can hear it in music, yeah? Klezmer is also something that Desetnikov uses quite a lot. Yeah. I I think there, there is maybe some suggestions, but uh, you know, I, I also hear very clearly, sort of again, kinds of music I associate with what are often called national styles, Romanian style, Romanian city style, Hungarian style, that, that are all sort of creeping through the set in, in a way I think that gives it its, I mean, uh, maybe what Larry's talking about, this sense of, of recapturing the polyglot Habsburg past uh, where everyone was living cheek by jowl, even though, of course, the various folk cultures might have been quite separate in their little regions, but coming together in this way, quite beautiful. Okay, are we ready to open this up to the, we're ready to open it up to all of you. If, if there are questions, please uh, feel free. Yes. Oh, I guess you're going to deliver to Mike. Was there ever a plan for there to be a set or setting for this ballet? Uh, there was no plan because we knew there is no budget for it. Okay. <laughs> but then, uh, after the opening, there was a thought. There was a thought that will add a, a, an image on the backdrop. So it's still considered. I'm not sure. Do you want to say what that image would be? Uh, probably an abstract version of a landscape. A mountainous landscape. Mountainous landscape, yes. You said that you, uh, you looked at the lyrics of the songs, and so I wondered whether any images remained after images remain from the from the lyrics. Well, there were some uh, there were some very strong images. Like in one of the songs was a, uh, a soldier, a body cut in many many pieces. Um, there was uh, a couple of a couple of songs where. Uh, the uh, uh, the woman is uh, is uh, crying over 
her uh, killed, killed fiance. Um, so yeah, sad images, um, mostly. I'm interested to hear what the composer thought of the work you made to his music. Can you repeat the question? Uh, did the composer of the music, did he give you any response or feedback to the work that you made? You know, uh, he's, he's a wonderful man, absolutely extraordinary man, with a very uh, sophisticated sense of humor. And um, um, I should have prepared some comments of his. He was uh, like, he didn't say much, he didn't say much. I remember that he was struck by the beauty of Calvin. Uh, who wasn't the first cast at that moment. And then, so he was very happy that Calvin got the opening. Um, deep inside, I sense that maybe he was not that happy with the ballet. Uh, uh, he, I know that he loved Russian seasons and uh, another ballet that I did on his music, uh, uh, Old Ladies Falling Out that was done in Moscow for the uh, Territoria Festival. Um, but it's, um, yeah, he's uh, sort of, we have uh, a relationship that um, is sometimes a bit formal. We play, we play that way with each other. So I, I would like to hear his very honest response, but I, I doubt he would, he, would, <laughs> he would actually reveal himself there. Anyone else? Can, I, I'm just going to ask one last question, maybe, then. Is, is, do you think about, you've talked a bit about Russian seasons, but what about Odessa? Yes, that's, uh, that's one of his most popular scores. It was written for the film, for the movie, based on uh, Isaac Babel, uh, um, Odessa stories from the 1920s, a wonderful literature. And the film was okay, but the music is like his hit, his, his most popular composition. And uh, I was just thrilled to use to use this music. And do you think of it in any way? And how do you think of its relationship to this this dance? Uh, to Bukovina, uh, apart from the name of the composer, I don't think there is much in common. Uh, I would, I would uh, be very nervous to call it Bukovina, songs in Bukovina, because <laughs> they might look at it and say, well, what is Bukovina about this Bukovina? Oh, so, uh, um, you know, the ballet in Kiev, uh, it's where I uh, first started my career as a dancer. I danced there for seven years and uh, later as a guest. It's very much in a, um, you know, um, um, the productions, the set designs, the costumes, the style of dancing is very much of the past. It's like Soviet ballet of uh, 1970s or 1980s. Uh, they have wonderful school, very talented dancers. Many uh, dancers who graduated from Kiev Ballet School are uh, world ballet stars like Zakharova, like uh, Kajiharu, like Matvienko, uh, Dvorovenko, Belotserkovsky, uh, Putrov, uh, uh, Palunin. Like, uh, it's a really, really strong school. But um, I'm not sure they would appreciate uh, the choreography. I don't know. It's like. Um, yeah, that's, that's my answer, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's give it here, yeah. I would be curious to, to see the reaction. I think we have time for one more, do we? Is anybody else? Yeah. Okay, well, Oh, uh, yes, uh, she, she asked, I mentioned national music, and could I say something about that, or, or what the heck did I mean by that? Uh, no, she, that was a much kinder question than that. Uh, well, look, um, you know, we're, we're all familiar with 
both the seeming inevitability and irrationality of nations as default settings for groups of people. And in terms of, of folk songs, often these, these songs which you could understand even at the level of a single village or a group of villages, uh, at, at various times in, in European history, depending on the country, were, were nationalized in effect. So, you know, it's the, this phenomenon you take, you know, in, in, in my area where I study, which is the Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic, Bohemia, you know, you, you take uh, the Moldau River, you take a song from a particular area of the country, uh, you take a building, and you irrationally connect them and say, ah, oh, they're all Czech. Uh, but, but really, if stylistically or, or in any other way, there's nothing that connects them. They're still, even though there's no more Czechoslovakia, they're still publishing something called the National Songbook, out of which they've left in, but mostly cut out the Slovak songs. So, so at various times, the, the nations who had the power, they had the academies of sciences. So I'll give you an example. Um, both the Hungarian Academy of Sciences and the Romanian Academy of Sciences have books about the history of Transylvania. They don't share a single fact. As the Romanian Academy of Science says it's all Romanian, was always Romanian. The so, so you have these levels and, and folk song collections, even though some of them have regional names associated, were usually sucked in to one of these national groups. So, so the, the level of the nation often determined, people would say, oh, this is a Romanian song, a Hungarian song, even though there are really many other ways one could slice and dice it. Alexei, do you have anything else you'd like to say to finish us off? Well, uh, it's uh, really brought some very different perspectives <laughs> uh, and um, uh, very interesting. Thank you, thank you for, for everything you said. Um, so I'm, yeah, uh, just uh, thank you for coming. <laughs> and, and thank uh, you for for being so yeah. forthright. With I hope us. that uh, we have a good season and uh, we don't disappoint when the audience comes this year. Thank you all for being here tonight.